In this series, I meet extraordinary Australians <laughs> who tell me their fascinating stories while I paint their portrait. I was able to be the person who I am. He was a really beautiful little boy. My challenge is to capture their character and put it on the canvas. The portrait is theirs to keep, so I want them to like it. <gasps> oh. That's me. Oh. oh, my God. Wow. I love this. Welcome to Arne's Brush With Fame. Hot potato, hot potato. Anthony Field is a founding member of what is considered Australia's greatest entertainment export. When he swapped his lead guitar in a rock band for the Blue Skivvy 25 years ago, he and his fellow Wiggles helped change the face of children's entertainment around the world. Please jump, everybody. Big jump. I'm hoping to get to know the man behind the catchy tune and dazzling smile. I don't know what he's got to capture, you know, sadness or happiness. I don't know, because I'm not exactly the same happy fellow the Wiggles are off, so, you know, a bit more down. So I don't know if he's going to go the wiggly path or in between. Anthony always seems to have a boundless energy. He has such creative talent and a wonderful ability to connect with his audience. My challenge is to capture that energy and warmth. Anthony, how are you, mate? Welcome. Oh, it's great to be here. Mate, take a seat. Yeah, beauty. Thanks for, uh, for coming along today. Oh, who are the uh, pictures of? Oh, that, that's just a, a friend of mine. He's oh. got a big, hairy face, and it, he's just great for painting, you know? Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I paint a beard, I don't have to paint jaw, chin, like all the hard bits. Yeah, right. Just <laughs> some beard. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go back to your childhood. You yeah. grew up one of seven kids in Sydney yeah. in, in a little three-bedroom house, but there was always lots of music, yeah? My mum, uh, she's a great piano player. She just gave us the love of music and, you know, an ownership of music. You know, I think that's really important that you don't make music unattainable. For, you don't have to play an instrument to own music, you know? Well, what did you play when you were a kid? Violin. I was a, yeah, I was violin until I got to high school and uh, this stirring happened, you know? I got sort of stirred out of it, you know? I thought, OK, I'd better start guitar. <laughs> <laughs> Your dad was a pharmacist and he dispensed methadone to heroin addicts. Yeah, and he was uh, one of the guys who went that extra year. You know, he really cared about uh, doing something for people. And um, so we opened up a methadone clinic for the heroin addicts and they come and be as, you know, friendly as, because they loved him. But then uh, sometimes in the throes of the addiction, same guys that, you know, he was looking after would come back and um, he got held, uh, they came back with tomahawks one time and um, one time my sister was working there and um, one of these guys came back and held a gun to my sister's head and dad, he wrestled the gun off the guy and he actually, dad clicked it, but luckily it didn't go off, just in the heat and then he had a heart attack. Oh, and what happened, did the guy run off? What happened? Yeah, he... yeah, but they usually got these guys because they were, they were all, they were all um, clients of dad's, you know, so they knew he, he knew who they were. He's got the address yeah. on the prescription. <laughs> yeah, you know, so they actually ran a, a story in the local paper saying dad was a hero and it was never the same after that. And uh, I think he just absolutely said, I can't take it anymore. And he went to Blacktown Hospital and became a hospital pharmacist. Oh, OK. It's great, mate. He just relaxed. In high school, you went to St Joseph's, uh, yeah. big, big exclusives boarding school. Mum and Dad sent me there because my dad went there. My brothers all went and had a great time. But um, for me, it wasn't a great experience, I, I, I must admit. There were some really good people there and good teachers and things, but it just didn't work for me, you know? Yeah. yeah. Was it during your teenage years that you, you started um, getting a little bit of depression? Yeah, it was, actually. I mean, boarding school was... Uh, there's things that happened there which I wouldn't go into, but they were too much for a young, you know, teenager to sort of cope with by yourself, you know, you're away from your parents. And I think as years rolled on, you know, that's just started feeling bad about myself. Can you help me understand w what that feeling is like? When you're in that zone, you feel like you're 
You shouldn't be on the earth, basically. You, you, you're a waste of time. You're in a crowd with people and you feel like you're the only person who feels like that. They don't understand me. No one understands me. No one gets me. I didn't ever resent anyone for being happy. Going to a wedding or things like that, I just, just seek. This stuff's not for me. Towards the end of uh, school, your older brothers, John and Paul, formed the Cockroaches. Yeah. And you weren't even 18 and you joined the band as well. Yeah. The boys would get gigs um, outside of school and I had to escape <laughs> from the prison camp. That how I viewed Joey's <laughs> boarding school. They'd be waiting outside in a van, <laughs> like the Italian job or something like that. And I'd sort of scale the fence. There's the car, jump in, let's go boys. And off we go and, uh, oh, it was great, mate. How old were you? Uh, 16, 17, yeah. playing yeah. pubs up and down from probably from, not so much Melbourne, but Sydney up to, right up to Cairns. Uh, we had a top 10 hit with She's The One and uh, uh, platinum album. And Jeff Fat joined the Cockroaches. And the only thing I ever do when I hear that name is smile because Jeff, he's a lesson in how to live your life, Jeff. Jeff was delivering PAs. He had a PA company. Yeah. And we used to hire the PAs off him. And Jeff is a really great um, boogie woogie piano player. And I used to watch him play in this rockabilly band. It was a bit of an idol of mine, Jeff. <laughs> yeah. We had a gig in Newcastle. Jeff said, look, I'll take the PA to Newcastle as long as you let me play with you guys. <laughs> Yeah, man, no worries. Although the cockroaches helped distract Anthony from his depression, he still struggled with it to the point that his father stepped in to help. He really supported you guys. Like, he, he went on tour for a while. He came on tour because he was actually worried about me. I'd started, <laughs> listen to this one, because I was depressed, I started gambling. He just packed his bag, he gave up the pharmacy, said, mate, I, I want to come and do the merchandise with you guys. He didn't know it at the time. He came to look after me, basically, and uh, that's when he saw how I was and he got me some help. You know, my dad was, I don't think the guy ever put a foot wrong, honestly. He's, he, um, and that was part of my problem too, that I had these great parents and yet I was feeling like absolute, the worst person in the world, you know. In a surprise move, Anthony left the cockroaches in 1982 to join the army. What happened is I was going out with uh, my first love and I had some sort of a, you know, lover's tiff. Also, I had a real love of Elvis. Like, I'm still ridiculously obsessed. And I watched G.I. Blues and I thought, man, that looks like so much fun. <laughs> so, <laughs> Excellent. I, the greatest shock was to my mum. I went and just signed up. I didn't tell mum and dad. didn't tell anyone rang up and said, look, I'm leaving on this day. And my mum, man, she went crazy. My girlfriend went crazy. Talk me through, what, what, what did mum say? What, how was that? Oh, she was crying her eyes out, you know, and um, my um, the girlfriend called me a bastard. <laughs> you bastard, how can you do this to me? I was like, she was right in a way, I should have. How old were you at the time? Um, you know, in the old, God help me, I was only 18. <laughs> Private Anthony Field. Private effing Field is what they used to call me, but um, I was in the infantry and I drove an armoured personnel carrier. I went to Germany and uh, the wall hadn't come down yet. Uh, I was doing guard duty over there with a, a, a Uzi machine gun, but fully loaded. 18 and, and you got an Uzi machine gun yeah, guarding like, the wall yeah. in Germany. It was great, mate. <laughs> of all the awards we've won and you know, all the great accolades we've had, and we're so grateful for. But I've got a defence medal for doing the Australian Army, and I'm, that's, I'm prouder of that than anything because that was out of my comfort zone. And it was so, uh, yeah, that's my that's my proudest moment. Amazing. Yeah. Anthony left the army in 1985, and at 22 he rejoined the band. Three years later, the Field family suffered a tragic loss, and then in 1988 there was a tragedy in the family. Yeah, Paul. Um, we were on the road in the cockies, you know, going from one hotel to the other, playing the gigs, woo, you know, party. Paul was always different because he was married and he was, you know, pretty serious compared to Johnny and I. We were just, we were just party guys, as you would be in your 20s sure. playing gigs. We were up in, uh, up in one of the resort towns 
Mate, I heard this scream from my hotel room. I could hear these two. Again, my dad was on the road. So I heard this scream, a guttural scream, uh, like an animal that had been wounded. And I went, Jesus, what's that? And uh, race down, there's my brother, mate. He's, and my dad's got his arm around him and he's like, like in this, just screaming. And uh, of course, he just heard that his daughter had, uh, had passed away with, with, with cot death. But Pauline, uh, his wife, and Paul, mate, that, that just turned their world. Mate, it, it would drive you crazy. I know that would, they, they almost went mad, they did. The first time I saw my dad cry too, he's bawling his eyes out. And, uh, mate, that just shouted everybody. Paul organised a, uh, a big concert called um, Cradle Rock. Um, wanted to do something, you know. And you know the first guy who put his hands up to do that was um, Jimmy Barnes. Yeah. And we've been mates ever since. Um, and a whole lot of other great acts, you know, just to raise some money for, for, for SIDS. And now, these days, the, the Wiggles are involved every year in helping raise awareness for Red Nose Day. Capturing Anthony is tricky. There's his depression, which can be a dark place. But then on the other hand, he's the blue wiggle with all the energy and positivity that comes with that. I want to get a shade of blue in here, but I also want to get his strength. The early 90s saw the birth of the Wiggles, and like many births, it was the result of a happy accident. My sister said, look, can you drive me to um, it's the Institute of Early Childhood Studies? I'm doing a mature age test. I drove her there and I looked around, I just saw women everywhere. And I, went, <laughs> I said, mate, I might do the test too. She went, yeah, OK. So I did the test. We both got in. Colleen lasted five days and said, I don't want to do it. I'll admit it, the first six to 12 months of the, the university course, I was there just because I was loving seeing women everywhere. <laughs> but as it went on, I really enjoyed the course about early childhood learning, uh, about child development, child psychology. And so, I, yeah, I got in there for the wrong reasons. The Wiggles existed because Anthony Fuel... Hormones. <laughs> <laughs> My hormones. Hormones. <laughs> it was. <laughs> So you're still at uni learning about this stuff. And that's when you thought, you know what, I'm going to start the Wiggles. I actually did an audition for play school in my final year at uni. Mm -hmm. And I got called back. And my voice is, honestly, I can't sing to, to, from a supper. <laughs> um, I, you know, I play instruments and I can write songs and things, but I went, OK, well, I, I'm going to form my own little kids group, but get a singer. And, you know, Greg was at uni and he has the voice of an angel. Great voice. Murray was there, guitar player, and, and of course, Jeff, you know, I rang him up and said, can you come down and do it? I'm doing a kid's album. Guess what his reaction was? What? How long will it take? <laughs> <laughs> I'm painting. He was painting the house. <laughs> that, how, how long will this take? Yeah. 50 years, Jeff. 25 years, mate. Yeah. <laughs> wow. And then it started really small, didn't it? Like, yeah, really... like birthday parties. Dorothy was just like a, basically a head and a little bit of a rag, really. We made our own costumes. <laughs> But we only did it really because we loved doing it. It wasn't to make money or be a career. But it took off very fast. It really did. It was, I think, because the songs were so good and we, we knew how to talk to children in a way that they understood. So how long was it and, and before you started, you know, really going off? When we appeared on the Midday Show and made things change, it was like we got um, the blessing of the gods when we went on the Ray Martin sure. Midday Show because everybody saw us. So we got all these bookings. Wow. And we went to ABC and Murray and I wrote basically a thesis on what we'd done. Yes. Straight out of university, we wrote on each song, we wrote why this was good for a child. What was the objective behind writing this? So I don't think the ABC had ever got a demo tape with why this is good for children. They basically said to us, yeah, it's great, we'll release it, but you'll be lucky to sell a thousand copies. I mean, well, that'd be great if we did. We did. It wasn't why we were doing it, so. And of course, it just sold hundreds of thousands. Wiggle to this song. Let's all see. Ba -dum, 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 ba 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 You got three kids, Anthony. How do they deal with, um, you know, Dad's the Blue Wiggle? Is it weird or anything? You know, it's funny. It was really great. Lucia, my eldest, she was a little two year old, three year old. She developed a real obsession for the Wiggles. And we had this song that we did with Kamal. 
and Dorothy, and it was called Sing With Me. And one day, she watched it, and we counted 34 times in a row and danced it. And it was like an out-of-body experience for me because I actually got to see what, when they're in the zone, how incredibly amazing that communication and how they're one with what's going on. The next day, I kid you not, we were, we're doing TV and Jeff and Murray and Greg are there and I went in like a, a fan parent and I shook their hands and I went, thank you guys. You gave my daughter one of the most beautiful experiences yesterday. So I've seen them as, and, and all three of them love the Wiggles and all three of them would do the same thing. Talk to me as though I'm not a Wiggle. Look what Murray's doing. Look at Captain Feathersword. As though I'm not there. It was almost like they blocked me. <laughs> Lucia's now, you know, 13 and um, I said, oh, you know, when I, you know, parents day, you want me to come and sing to, to Chugga Chugga? No, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> In 1998, Anthony lost one of his greatest supporters and the family once again had to deal with the tragedy, the passing of their father. Mate, when he had his uh, stroke, we went to the hospital and, the, and they had all these medications. They told us to bring his medications in. And they said, how long has he had cancer for? And we all looked at each other and went, he's got cancer. <laughs> said, yeah, he's, got, he's got cancer. And it was, mate, we didn't even know. Oh, gosh. That was, he was, <laughs> He was one of a kind, mate. Yep. He didn't want to burden us, you know. And then how long after that did he... Um... Oh, yeah, uh, there was a stroke. Actually um, finished him, you know. But, yeah. I'd sometimes look out in the audience and imagine he's there, you know. Do you? Yeah. At the height of, of the Wheels phenomenon, how big, how big was it? In Australia, the, the new Wiggles are honestly as big, if not bigger, than the original Wiggles. Yes. But what the original Wiggles did was crack America mm. in a way that was insane. Our first time to America, we uh, did a show at a Blockbus video and four people turned up. Four people? Four people. And we thought, wow, what are we doing here? And this is already, you're already big in Australia. We're massive in Australia. Anyway, Disney Channel looked at us and went, this is crazy enough and different enough and, and good quality. We're gonna do it. And we're on four times a day on the Disney Channel. Wow. So we came back to America and when we went through security, you know, customs, they, they recognised us. Wake up, Jeff. Mate, we looked at each other and said, what's happened? So on that tour, we sold 13 uh, Madison Square Garden concerts. We sold them out. chug a chug a big red car. We'll travel near and we'll travel far. Toot, toot, chug a chug a big red car. We're gonna ride the whole day long. It, it, it's hard for people to, to understand that uh, there's Anthony is on, on top of the world, performing to thousands of children. Yeah. What's that like, Anthony, to go from thousands of children to being on your own and feeling sad? This is in the worst of my depression. I still love the shows. I'm sure it's the same with you when you're performing. It's, it's just, I don't know, there's no cares in the world. It's just when you came off the stage, you were back to me. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'd be in the dressing rooms, I'd be bawling my eyes out by myself after you just played to us, you know, a couple of thousand people have gone, whoa, and all the guys are backstage having a great time, and I'm in there like... <laughs> and did the other boys know? Jeff is a way of uh, really understanding without saying anything. Murray sort of understood what was going on probably better than most. He's actually the only guy that didn't... That's not knocking the other guys. He's the only guy. And this is before the campaign of ask people how they are. Yeah. He actually came up to me and mate, are you OK? This is sort of happening a lot. There must be something going on. You know, so I always acknowledge that Murray was the one that first said that. And it does help when people jump in and say, are you OK? Because the first time I thought to myself, why, so this is not right? I mean, this is, there's another way. You were working so hard, it really took a toll on your body. Yeah, I was eating myself sick. I was 16 k's heavier. I was depressed out of my brain. I was, oh, mate, we were, we were on top of the world and I was on the bottom of it, you know. Does something bring it on, Anthony, or...? Mate, I, I had it a couple of years ago, really, really bad, you know, like, dangerously bad. Um, I got great therapy, I got great help. One of the things, I, one of the lessons I learned was to live in the moment. Yes. And I do live in the moment, so 
I'm here now. Yeah. Or if you know if I'm pouring a coffee, I love that coffee for that moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and that stops you going, well, what, what, what happened? What happened? You know. So. And how, what what was it like just a few years ago? Oh, it was bad, mate. I mean, um, uh, you know, I'm married with with kids, and if you're in that really really bad, you know, you're sitting there on a couch, and your kids are coming up talking to you, and, and basically you just you can't even acknowledge. You don't feel anything, so you know they're beautiful, and they're, you like in, when you're not, you know, they're, they're your world. But at this moment, they're just you're like a zombie, you know. And uh, they were bad times. I never was angry to the kids or angry to Mickey, my wife, or anything like that. I was just sad. Did it ever get close to to suicide? Oh, a couple of times on the road, yeah, um, the scariest side of it is that when you're in that zone and you're actually thinking about doing the, the you know, the, the worst thing possible you can do to yourself, you actually think that that's a release and that it will be better. I went into my psychologist and said, I've got the, this is serious. I went in in my almost wiggly elation and I went, I found the solution. And she was brilliant. She went, that is not the solution, Gosh. Anthony. That is not the solution. But my brain was going, this is it. I was actually, whoa. Did it ever occur to you how much pain the family would go through? See, when you're in that, you know, they say it's selfish and all that. When you're in that zone, you, you don't even, you, you think the opposite. You think you're doing a good thing yeah. for them. I went on a, a drug that got me out of the loop of thinking that. Yes. And, you know, I, I, for two or three years, I was on that and, and, now I'm drug free and really good now, but but mate, it was yeah, it was it's pretty wild to get back to it. It's funny. It's almost like I'm talking about another guy at the moment. And for the last maybe five years, I've been really good. So we're lucky to have you, mate. You yeah. well, the, the the depression in me would say you're not lucky to have me. You know what I mean? Because I'm still not at the. Uh, you still never think you're a, a good person. So. Would you say, if I said to you, we're lucky to have you? I'd say, nah, but in my head, I, I, I'd think to myself, I reckon you are. Okay. <laughs> no, that's great. That's yeah. healthy. Yeah. I wouldn't even be able to fake, yeah, you're lucky. Because I wouldn't even never think that. And that's not false modesty you're doing. That's a good, healthy self-esteem you have. Yeah. So I still don't have that. But, yeah. yeah I, and I work myself silly still. I, we, we, I'm always working, always at the studio, but I keep myself happy. It's like your art, I'm sure... You just get into some zone, mate, and it's like, that's what I love. I love being in the studio. Yeah. I love being on stage, working with other people. All right, Anthony, I'm nearly done. You know, if I'm being honest, I don't even want to see it. Okay. Is that, do people like that? Uh, yeah, no, 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 it's, yes, just okay. about everyone's nervous. No, not for that reason. I, yes. Yeah. I'm not, it's, I just love talking to you, man. It was great. Yeah, sure. But is that, is that, Crazy? No, not at all. <laughs> I hate to see what you picked up in the picture. That's <laughs> <laughs> I need about 10, 15 minutes. Just yeah, right. To, I'll just get, I'll leave you to it. Just tidy up. Um, yeah. I'll bring you back. Yeah. And we'll spin around. I'm worried about my reaction. But anyway, <laughs> we'll, we'll see you. Good on you, mate. Yeah, I'm not really looking forward to it at all. In fact, if we just spoke, and that would that would be great. This is kind of outside the comfort zone. How does someone see you? I think what springs to mind to me about the chat was Arne's energy. He has such a lovely energy, which encourages you to just talk and be open and free. We already knew that Anthony is one of the world's best children's entertainers. But what a lot of us didn't know are all the struggles he's been through, the tough times. I need to somehow get all of that into this painting. Right, Anthony, I'm done. Oh, my goodness. Come in. <laughs> Are you nervous? Yeah, every time. So the first thing I noticed about you when you walked in was how fit you look. So I wanted to get a fit and strong Anthony. OK. And I figured you've probably got thousands of photos of you doing that. Yeah. So I went for a little bit of an introspective, Anthony, OK. As yeah. well. That was what I was scared of. <laughs> <laughs> Close right your eyes. Right. Yeah, Close look. your eyes. All right, Anthony, open your eyes. Wow. 
Wow. Fantastic, man. <laughs> Scary, but it's fantastic. I'm a bit scared of that, but it's great, mate. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how's it scary? I don't know. I, I, it's it's beautiful, but it, yeah, it's just looking at me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Great stuff, mate. You're very talented. Yeah, you didn't get the gold too, so I thought you'd I, I, <laughs> I snuck a little bit of the blue into the shadows there. Oh, yeah. Because you told me how, you know, being the blue wiggle kept depression at bay. Yeah, it's it's confronting. That's what it is. Yeah, sure. Yeah. What, what is it? Is it Especially the... looking in the mirror, and you, you know, you know, you don't want to do that. You know, so it's, it's good. You just want to keep going forward. Man. <laughs> and there's a little bit of that. Um, I didn't want to make it just uh, sad, but there's just a little bit of introspection. You know? Yeah, great, mate. Bloody beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, brother. Good on you. Thanks, Andy. Great, mate. Thanks mate. A lot, mate. Wow. Jeez, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> it was very confronting seeing the portrait, which is. You know, beautifully done, and it's a very powerful portrait. And it's something that, uh, as a Wiggle, you never get a, an image like that. You wouldn't think of Anthony Wiggle as an image like that. Because um, I don't, I, one way I deal with the world, I just keep going ahead, doing shows, keep moving on. To sit and look at that was very confronting, and even now I feel like I just want to run away. I'm really thankful Anthony came on the show today. That was really challenging for him to share and to sit for a portrait. What a great bloke. Next time, it's the straight talking girl from Perth who conquered the world. I try to get Megan Gale's passion into her portrait. He was so beautiful. He was just the most beautiful little thing. <gasps> oh my God, that's me.